Good evening from Bonn. Uh, members of Parliament, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, dear Jeff, it's a great pleasure uh, to say a first word of welcome from Bonn University. Um, I'm Ulrich Schlie, and this is the first digital event of the International Security Forum Bonn in 2020. Um, we are looking forward to a great discussion on transatlantic uh, relations. Uh, and um, if I would like to thank our co-host, Jeff, your partner institute, um, I'm delighted to see so many following our event. And I would like to invite you um, in the days to come to join our International Security Forum in Bonn. We are looking forward to a discussion which is in the centerpiece of transatlantic relations, um, the contribution of German foreign and security policy. And I also would like uh, to take the opportunity to commemorate um, uh, Guido Goldman, who has passed. Guido uh, has made a tremendous contribution to the transatlantic relationship at Harvard University. And um, I'm sure that uh, Jeff will say a few words and we will also commemorate tomorrow, at the first day here in Bonn, the passing of Guido. So without further ado, Jeff, um, I hand over to you. Again, many thanks for the interesting discussion. Um, and for our contributions so far and looking forward um, to the next few days. Many thanks again for all those who are interested in, in the substance. And again, looking forward. Thank you so much for your interest. Well, Professor Schlee, um, uh, Ulrich, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I am Jeff Rafke, president of the American Institute for Contemporary German Studies at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, and I'm really pleased to welcome um, uh, all of our viewers out there, and there are quite a few of you, uh, for, this, uh, for this discussion. Uh, I'm also grateful for the partnership between AICGS and the Center for Advanced Security, Strategic, and Integration Studies um, at the University of Bonn. We are proud to be a partner in this International Security Forum <laughs> for the fifth year. Um, and it is an honor that our webinar is going to help kick off this year's uh, forum. And we have a very terrific lineup, uh, so I look forward to getting started. But first, uh, as Ulrich mentioned, I, I want to open uh, with a word of remembrance for an individual who has made an indelible mark uh, on the transatlantic community. Uh, many of you will have heard that uh, Guido Goldman died yesterday. He was 82. Uh, Guido was perhaps best known as the founding president of the German Marshall Fund of the United States. Um, he was also a founding member of uh, my board of trustees at AICGS. Um, Guido was a builder and an innovator of transatlantic organizations, and he is part of the reason that we are uh, in this conference today. He generously supported the contacts between AICGS and the Kissinger Chair um, at Bonn, and he made the American participation in the forum possible in previous years, back in the days when we could still gather in person. Um, Carl Kaiser was also central to this role and the, that we play now in the International Security Forum, for which we remain uh, deeply grateful. But above all, Guido Goldman valued dialogue and building strong international ties in order to avoid conflict, end conflict, and to repair after conflict. So that's what brings us here. And with, uh, with thanks to Guido and in his spirit, um, we will get uh, started. And in our, in our session today, uh, we're going to talk uh, about uh, Germany's contribution to uh, European security. We are at the advent of a new United States administration with a more complicated international security environment. We are also at the start of a German electoral cycle that will see a new chancellor in office um, about one year from now. So this is a vital topic, I think it's, uh, uh, everyone will agree. And I'm glad that we have five excellent contributors to our discussion. We have two members of the German Bundestag, both are Ulrich from the CSU and Omid Nuripur from the Green Party. 
we have two European observers, um, Slavik Debski uh, and David Bertolotti, and one of Germany's leading um, security policy analysts, Claudia Mayor. So um, as we get started, I will turn first to our members of the, of the German Bundestag uh, and ask them for, for their um, perspectives on Germany's defense needs and ambitions, in particular in a, in a European um, context. And if I could, uh, if I could say, um, uh, you know, I think everyone will have observed the debates in the last uh, few weeks uh, carried out largely in public uh, between the, um, among others, the French president, uh, the German defense minister, uh, about questions of strategic autonomy, about European sovereignty, um, and so forth. Uh, yeah. Sorry about that. Can uh, if I'm back? Hello. Okay. So Volker Ulrich, the floor is yours. So <clears throat> good evening, everybody. I just uh, tuned in, so I also had some sound problems. So I did not hear what you recently said, but uh, I think I had to go on with some uh, issues uh, concerning uh, our topic today. And I'm glad that uh, <clears throat> Obit Nuripo is joining us uh, in order to not only make uh, a counterpoint, but uh, in order to um, boost our uh, insights on transatlantic uh, relationships. So thank you for organizing um, this evening. And I will start by, um, <clears throat> by what Joe Biden, the president-elect, said uh, almost two years ago at the Munich Security Conference. He said, uh, we will be back. And uh, I think uh, the United States are Back and um, it's now upon us to uh, strengthen uh, transatlantic partnership and um, uh, to fight against uh, the disappointments because uh, everybody now is on the track to uh, paint a transatlantic relationship in uh, beautiful colors, whereas uh, there are some crucial decisions on uh, the national as well as on European uh, level uh, to be taken. Uh, I think um, there are some uh, issues to be addressed and um, I will start with, uh, an, I will start with uh, the issue of uh, the Paris uh, Climate Agreement. It's uh, not on, it's, it's not a core issue, a core security issue, uh, whereas it's uh, very important for us to uh, rely on the topic because uh, climate, tackling climate change and security issues uh, will be meddling uh, within the next years to come. So it uh, will be a, a very uh, um, important issue. And uh, the fact that uh, John Kerry as um, um, the leading figure of uh, uh, uniting the international community uh, uh, towards uh, the fight against climate change uh, will also require some um, um, uh, some investments on the European level to decrease uh, uh, carbon dioxide emissions, and uh, <clears throat> it's uh, very important to uh, to deal with the question. Uh, I think. Um, uh, strengthen the um, transatlantic partnership will not only be a matter of uh, trade and uh, investment uh, partnership. It's uh, 
uh, first and foremost, um, uh, a security issue. And I think it's all about um, redefining and reinviting, uh, reinventing the role of NATO. <clears throat> I think there will be <clears throat> within the Biden administration a new uh, pivot to Asia when it comes to uh, to China and uh, regarding all the issues related to the Pacific area. And so it will up to uh, us as European states um, to assume some kind of role the United States have taken over for the last years when it comes uh, uh, to NATO capabilities. It's not only a question of whether we will reach uh, the two percent threshold or not it's uh, first and foremost a discussion whether we are able uh, to do uh, and to fulfill the, cap the capabilities we are required to so and maybe um, under a Biden administration the withdrawal of uh, US troops from Europe will not uh, longer be a question of uh, importance but if the United States will pivot uh, to Asia and uh, towards um, uh, all the challenges in the Pacific area, uh, there will be a kind of um, um, a kind of necessity to uh, fulfill uh, the duties uh, within Europe and it's up to us to, um, uh, to fulfill the duties. And I think we should more focus on, um, on the human rights issue because during the last year, international policy, poli policy has not been taken into account to a much greater extent uh, that the human rights issue is uh, what uh, Europe and the United States are, are about to to bring on the verge of uh, international policy. And uh, there are lots of um, uh, human rights violations all over the world. And I think it could be a matter of international uh, security policy to address uh, human rights issues as well. So I think we should... Um, um, we should take into consideration to uh, uh, to address the human rights issue on uh, on an international level. And uh, talking about human rights, I think there should be um, a more distinguished role about addressing and uh, defending democracy and the rule of law. So that rule of law and democracy uh, will prevail. Um, on an international level, security will be challenged by not only security, Western standard of living and uh, our freedom will be challenged by authoritarian states. And uh, uh, we, we have to think about uh, in the question uh, which role of living, which kind of international order will prevail, democracy and the rule of law or authoritarian states. And um, I think uh, United States and Europe as well, we are on the same side. Um, and uh, we have to address uh, these issues and uh, uh, defend um, our systems from election meddling, from interference, by defending uh, f from misinformation and um, all the, the, the influx um, which uh, leads to a, a destabilization of, uh, of, of our order. And uh, last topic, uh, I think we should... Um, search for um, we, we should uh, we, search, we should search for 
a new role for European uh, defense policy because uh, the United States will focus on a strong Europe in order to fulfill, their, uh, to fulfill our duties. And it's up to us to, to, to build a European defense system with our French allies, with our European partners, in order to have a strong Europe, because I think the United States will focus and rely on a strong Europe uh, to maybe, let's say, to share the duties uh, in a way uh, in the world. So I hope to um, tell you more uh, on our discussion and uh, thanks for your invitation. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, for Volko Ulrich. Um, apologies for my uh, technical um, uh, difficulty earlier. Um, and uh, but that, thank you for that uh, comprehensive view of, of security. Um, and its uh, its role in in German policy. I would like to turn now to Omid Nouripour uh, of the Green Party, um, spokesperson for for foreign policy uh, in in the caucus uh, in the Bundestag. Um, uh, Omid, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for having me. And for for the audience, uh, I, I just checked the name, and there are a lot of uh, super experts there. I'm very happy to uh, to see, for example, uh, JD Bindenagel there. Hi, JD. We should go on talking. Uh, and for, for all of you guys, uh, the funniest thing backstage was everybody was joking about the internet situation in Germany one second before Jeff was completely frozen. And I love to see that. Uh, but let me come to the questions. Um, uh, you, you, just, uh, you just raised the question of, of um, Macron versus uh, the defense minister of Germany, if I get that right. To be honest, if I would, were not in part of the opposition, I would say both of them are right. So I just say both of them are wrong um, because, you know, obviously we have to stand up uh, and we have to do much more for, for European sovereignty for the moment when we see that we cannot rely on, on the United States. But there is no need for, for just separating and then saying we don't want to have cooperation with the United States. Not at this moment. We have now a president of the United States bringing back the mindset of cooperation instead of a transactional losing and winning deal. So he knows that that uh, um, a cooperation can can be beneficial for, for both sides of the pond, and this is good. So this is uh, why I think we have to do much more. We have to uh, stand for ourselves, but of course we need more cooperation also. Um, multilateralism, multilateralism is, is I think one of the most important things. There are a bunch of multilateral uh, multilateral uh, institutions. We need much more effort of of common cooperation in, in, into that in this institution. I'll just give you one example, which is obvious to anybody. Of course, Chinese influence today, WHO is definitely too, too big. We see it every day. But this is why we should invest more and then uh, just, just leave the, uh, the, the floor and, and let the Chinese have the, 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 the only dance there. Um, and you can, you can go for, for everything, the United Nations uh, bodies and, uh, and uh, WTO and, and so on and so on. Um, first. Second, uh, spoilers. Um, let me make it very brief. I think it would be helpful if it would be America's sidekick when it comes to China. Uh, and obviously China is in the long term the biggest challenge to our systems. As, as Falko was just, just mentioned, this is the systemic rivalry which is going to be more and more and we, should, and we cannot take it alone. And it's not only America's job, but this should be the sidekick. But it means also that I think when it comes to Russia, we would love to have the Americans on our side. And then we, we in the driver's seat, we can see it every day in Ukraine when, when Germany and then France took a huge leap uh, on the Normandy format. And I think it's the right thing to do. And where we have to do much more is about, is about our, our neighborhood, of course. And I do not see any understanding on the American side anymore after uh, 30 years of uh, the idea of uh, uh, partners and leadership to just, just help us out, help us out and bail us out when it comes to, to armed conflicts or, or political conflicts in, in our direct neighborhood. Uh, but it means that if we are achieving something, the Americans should let us do. Uh, it leads me to the JCPOA. JCPOA with Iran was highly controversial in the United States and there are a huge number of challenges with Iran and they're gonna get bigger in the next time. But they have the one problem where we, had, we could gain time for at least 10 years with the nuclear program they had. And because of the American way of 
dealing with that for the last three and a half years. Uh, you're back on, on 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 one, and then this is not not that that helpful. Um, when it comes when it, and, and the last one on on, on the question of mindset is, I think it's our job in Germany, especially, to understand that, especially for this administration and with all of these people, with all this, this, this personnel we are seeing, which uh, could 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 come to office. Uh, obviously, the phone number of Europe for this administration is going to be Berlin. This is a load of expectations and a lot of um, of, of uh, responsibility for, for for Germany, meaning that you are you have to do even more to keep the European Union together, to address issues which are relevant for, for the United States when it comes to, to, to when we come back to the table of, of, of talks and of course to promise things we can deliver. And we should of course work on our capabilities, capabilities to, to be able to deliver more and more. Um, by the way, adding these three things to me obviously means that the biggest spoiler for the next, next six months and you just mentioned that you're going to have election campaign in Germany also. So we're going to have a timetable between January 20 and the summer break in Germany where a lot of things could be done. And the spoiler there for, for the atmosphere of, of dialogue is Nord Stream. And I think Nord Stream is, would be a huge sign if it could get rid of for, for European uh, unity and a, good, and a sign of a good will toward our American friends. Uh, when it comes to the policies, there are a lot of things we have to talk about. And we, I started with the Nord Stream, and of course, there are a lot of other issues. Uh, definitely the question of, of uh, defense spending. But I think we're going to go there after, and we have three more super experts here I would love to hear. So thank you very much for having me, and I look forward for a uh, beneficial discussion. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, um, uh, Omid. Um, uh, we'll turn now to, to two um, uh, non-German experts. The first will be Slavek Debski, who is the director of the Polish uh, Institute for uh, International Security Affairs, uh, PISM. Um, and second will be David uh, Bertolotti, who is a former French diplomat, former director of strategic affairs uh, in the French foreign ministry, uh, now in the private sector. Uh, so Slavek, uh, why don't I turn to you first and uh, be interested in your, your views and also Polish views on uh, expectations from Germany um, with regard to European defense, Germany's role, and, uh, and how you see that develop. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jeff, for, for having me for, and, and for a great invitation. Um, uh, let me start with the following part. Uh, Poland and uh, Germany, uh, for the first time in, in, in their history, are members of the same alliance. Uh, we are integrated with each other, uh, both in, in uh, you know, in transatlantic area, so we share um, our interest to preserve peace uh, uh, in Europe and within the uh, European Union. So we also are, um, coordinate with, with uh, each other the way how uh, the whole Europe and our countries would develop uh, um, uh, in the future. So this framework is of, of huge imp importance because, because it is first historical achievement. Second, it's also obligation. Obligation for uh, uh, to uh, um, you know, work hand in hand, uh, face challenges together, and look for um, solutions of um, you know which um, we can solve these challenges and we meet these challenges ahead of us. So uh, um, Poland uh, expect uh, from Germany to be a credible um, ally, capable to provide um, assistance if such assistance is needed. Uh, and of course, because of geographic situation, um, Poles expect that Germany would play a, a role of facilitator of unity um, in the, in the, within the transatlantic area and of course in, in Europe. Um, for, you know, during the Cold War, uh, uh, Germany benefited a lot from, you know, this common defense uh, 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 policy. 
um, um, Germany could could have counted, you know, you know, for assistance of thirty uh, allies divisions to protect uh, uh, the well-being of of uh, German citizens. Now, countries of Central Europe uh, contribute to uh, German defense and security. Um, uh, more or less in the same way. However, uh, they are much uh, poorer than, than Germany. Germany is one of the wealthiest countries uh, around the world. So, um, uh, because of that, there is expectation that Germany would contribute much more to the common cause as, uh, um, as we can agree that defense and peace in Europe um, is uh, a common interest. So this leads me to the to the question of Biden administration, because definitely we uh, we should regard this administration, uh, which you know uh, from the public announcement of of uh, um, President Elect Biden and and uh, a group of people experts who are around him. Um, uh, we can we can we can we are able to come to the conclusion. That this administration uh, would focus uh, its policy on um, regaining credibility of American alliances, uh, rededication of of United States to the to the uh, uh, you know uh, to the world affairs and uh, international institutions, um, um, and Europe should use this. Uh, in this time, it's four, at least four years, um, to uh, upgrade uh, themselves in terms of capabilities, prepare for something which, which may come from the United States in the future. Because we have to uh, bear in mind that this sentiment which uh, you know, Trump brought uh, with himself to, the, you know, uh, to, the, uh, to American politics and also foreign policy, uh, would not disappear. There are a lot of dissatisfaction in, among the American public about the role the um, United States plays around the world, uh, about, about uh, um, uneven burden sharing uh, um, for this, you know, for providing peace uh, uh, in Europe. And of course, the challenges coming from uh, uh, China may, may additionally uh, divert attention of, of American political elite. Also, you know, very pro-European, but you know, by the very fact that you know others ch other challenges may be, you know, um, uh, much more, uh, um, um, uh, much more, you know, um, um, tangible or you know, uh, um, make cause troubles uh, quicker. Uh, sooner, uh, they they may simply um, uh, refocus themselves, um, pivot from Europe to uh, uh, to Asia, and and Europe uh, may um, appear uh, without this uh, very important uh, security umbrella, which has been provided by the United States, States for half a century, uh, at least for half a century. So. Um, uh, I believe, then, from a Polish point of view, uh, it's high time high time to end these discussions about the catchy phrases. How we are going to name our, uh, our, our policy goal? How we are going to um, um, uh, um, you know uh, which politicians are still the cover of of uh, of the Time magazine? Uh, this time should be uh, uh, devoted to uh, building real capabilities, um, uh, enhancing cooperation between our industry, because that's another problem. We want to deliver uh, more capabilities for European armies, but at the same time, we, need, we want to compete with each other. So uh, sometimes this, the, the discussion about how much uh, cooperation, how much competition, uh, block, uh, uh, you know, uh, effective, um, you know, uh, uh, cooperation producing uh, tangible capabilities, which are badly needed, both on the eastern flank and the southern flank. Um, so it's not uh, so much about strategic autonomy, 
but it is uh, much more about strategic cooperation, um, which is badly required both in Europe and within transatlantic relations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Slavic. Um, uh, David Bertolotti, um, you know, the partnership between France and Germany, of course, uh, is is politically um, uh, among the most uh, important uh, for Berlin, uh, but also in defense terms, um, including major um, major defense industrial projects. Um, so, uh, can you can you share with us uh, your views and perhaps uh, broader French views uh, about um, the expectations from Germany and uh, the, the trajectory of the bilateral relationship. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff, for, for having me uh, first. It's a, it's a pleasure to be uh, in the company of uh, such distinguished uh, speakers. It's also a pleasure to uh, see you again, uh, although it's, it's, it's only virtual. Um, so at, at the outset, I, I want to uh, stress that uh, as, as you said yourself I mean I'm, I'm speaking in a in a personal capacity uh, now I'm, I'm a former official and so do not expect uh, from me a sort of uh, quasi official reading of the Macron AKK uh, controversy uh, although I'll, I'll try to speak uh, about it uh, a bit from from my point of view uh, which actually, uh, if I can say something, at least from, from my uh, former time as director for strategic affairs, uh, it, it, to me, it looked uh, much more theological uh, than, than everyday work uh, uh, was in, in my time. And, and in particular, I have to say that I, I, I truly believe that, at least on the French side, we, we sort of uh, uh, have overcome uh, some of our uh, uh, our previous tendencies to to be a bit theological in, in particular, but I think that now uh, when French officials describe uh, their vision of the European defence, it's it's really based on three pillars, um, with one being NATO, uh, another one being the EU, and a third one being the web of of uh, bilateral and multilateral uh, defence cooperation relationships. Uh, with, of course, among the most important ones, the, the French-German bilateral uh, uh, relation. Uh, and, and so we, we, we try to be more pragmatic than before uh, about it and, and not necessarily, uh, you know, speak in terms of, of you know, big words and, uh, and, and, and big uh, uh, concepts. But, but what I would say also, uh, and, and that brings us uh, really to, uh, to tonight's topic, um, is, is that, I mean, my sense is that where, uh, where probably France, I mean, the way France comes at this debate uh, uh, about the defense of Europe uh, is, is that basically France is, is trying to prepare itself first, uh, but also Europe uh, for the day when uh, maybe the United States would no longer be ready to uh, always guarantee uh, European security or always be involved in all European security problems. The way Germany probably uh, still comes at things is, is that Germany would like to reinforce the European pillar uh, of, of NATO in order to convince the United States to stay committed to Europe and to maintain their presence uh, in, in Europe. The, of course, then the overarching conclusion is the same. Europe should do more. But I think the reasons why uh, um, we should do more uh, are, are, are not identical. And, and of course, it, it brings sometimes, or maybe actually often, um, different types of commitments. Um, um, I think that, I mean, Germany will probably tend uh, to favor uh, um, uh, commitments uh, on grounds of solidarity, and in particular solidarity with the American ally. Um, I mean, that's typically the case, I think, in, in, in Afghanistan, for instance, where Germany is still very much present. Um, Whereas France will probably operate much more on the basis uh, of, of perceived uh, security interests, French security interests, uh, but also European security interests. 
um, and, and, and sometimes uh, opposing uh, uh, American interests. Um, that was typically the case uh, a little bit more than a year ago uh, in, in the Gulf, um, when we decided to launch a, a naval mission, uh, MSO, uh, um, and, and that was really to back the European specific approach vis-a-vis -vis Gulf security and Iran, as opposed to a maximum pressure uh, approach uh, by, by the US. Uh, that actually, that example actually brings me uh, to, to raise uh, one other important uh, aspect of, of the matter when it comes to defense and also French expectations is, is the issue of the mandate, uh, the mandate that is always necessary for Germany to, to act. Uh, um, I mean, what we are usually told by, by uh, our, our German counterparts uh, is that Germany cannot commit forces uh, outside uh, a UN, EU, or NATO framework. Uh, and, and so, for instance, uh, participation in MSO uh, was not possible for Germany beyond a political uh, expression of support. Um, and, and, and Germany uh, did not commit uh, any ships uh, or maritime patrol aircraft um, because of that mandate problem. And, and so, uh, already perhaps jumping to the Q&A uh, session or discussion session among ourselves, but I, I would very much like, uh, now that I'm out of the service, to, to hear uh, what our German uh, uh, colleagues uh, have to say, um, you know, about this issue of mandate. I mean, would, would it be possible one day to consider a German commitment outside of a UN, EU or NATO mandate, provided it's clearly in response to some European uh, uh, interests. Um, uh, and, and again, it's a, it's a genuine question. It's not, it's not a trick question uh, on, 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 on my part. Um, now, uh, uh, I, I mean, I know that uh, uh, part of your interest is, is also uh, what, um, uh, what to do with a new U.S. administration uh, uh, arriving. Well, I'd say that perhaps, uh, uh, you know, sort of spontaneously in, in Paris, uh, there may be a bit of nervousness that the, the sort of initial tendency of the new U.S. administration would be to look at Berlin uh, to rebuild a, a relationship that's uh, seen as as, as damaged uh, by the, the Trump years. Uh, and, and of course, an easy way for the U.S. administration to signal a, a, a change of course vis-a-vis -vis Europe would be to repair that relationship to Germany and, and to uh, give more attention uh, to, to Berlin. Uh, and, and probably also to, to come back uh, to a, uh, a more classical uh, way of managing transatlantic relationships. Uh, however, I, I think as, as, as a French observer and a person interested in security, that there will be a, a number of issues um, that will not be back to, back to uh, usual business uh, with the US. Um, almost all previous speakers have mentioned uh, China uh, already, and, and of course, I think there will be a need for uh, um, a European uh, clear position on this, uh, what we can accept, what we cannot accept uh, in, in terms of uh, US requests to face uh, uh, China, uh, we'll, we'll have to define our position, and, and on that, I would point to, to another area of, of always, you know, quite harsh debates between, between France and Germany, but not just. Um, it's, it's this idea that Europe should have an India-Pacific uh, policy. I know it, it's seen by many as, as a buzzword. Uh, I know it's seen by some as, as just a, a French way to dress up an, an, an armaments uh, policy. Uh, with the UAE, India, and, and Australia, I genuinely think it is it is more than that, and it's just certainly a frustration for some in in Paris that there isn't uh, more uh, broader European interest um, to to look at that zone and 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 not just our neighbourhood. Uh, but the second issue I wanted to mention also, and that's our neighbourhood really, um, is is of course the Middle East uh, and even the Levant in in, in particular. Uh, I, I think we are still likely to be confronted uh, with a, a different U.S. approach 
uh, maybe still a, a temptation to withdraw or, or reduce a presence. And I think there again, it, it, it will be um, a good example of what I was mentioning earlier. You know, what would be what will be the reason to act? Uh, you know, are, are we there because the U.S. is the leader of the coalition against Daesh? Or are we there also because we think there are genuine counterterrorism interests uh, for Europe? And so um, if the U.S. would leave or take a back seat and ask us Europeans uh, to take care of the situation, would we be ready to do that? Uh, would there be an increased German commitment? Um, um, that's 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 to me uh, that's to me an an, an open uh, an, an open question. Uh, I could also mention, of course, but maybe it will come up in uh, in in the in the Q and A. I don't want to be too long, uh, but I could mention also, of course, uh, the, the the nuclear issue. Um, I, I think it's it, it, it's it's really a, a major issue in itself in in the French German conversation, uh, and 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 one that could. Um, be developed uh, in 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 the years to come. Just as a as a word of conclusion or temporary conclusion, I, I would like to say that of course, I mean, from a French point of view, um, the expectations about European defence and European security are, are not just addressed uh, at, at Germany. I, I I wouldn't want also our, our uh, viewers to uh, think that in the eyes of, uh, of France, it's only a German problem. Um, you know, if you if you look at the level of commitment or defense spending of, of Italy, of uh, Spain, um, it's it's clearly not just a, a, a German problem, and, and perhaps actually this is something we should address in in a French in a French, uh, in a French German uh, in a French German way. Uh, I, I, I wanted to stress that uh, uh, at at the end. But uh, thank you again for for having me and looking forward to the conversation as as it develops. Thank you very much, David. Um, and I think there's a lot there that we'll want to engage uh, on as we get to the discussion among the panelists and with, uh, with our audience. Um, but uh, before we do, I want to turn to, uh, to Claudia Mayor um, from the Stiftung Wissenschaft und Politik, uh, the German Institute for International Security Affairs, um, someone who knows the bilateral uh, French-German uh, defense relationship extremely well, but also uh, uh, European and international security issues. So. Uh, Claudia, I'd be uh, grateful to hear your your thoughts um, on, uh, of course, anything the previous speakers have mentioned, but also how you see the uh, electoral cycle uh, that uh, that Omid Nouripour uh, referred to uh, uh, affecting security and defense issues, um, and and what a new is is a new coalition, uh, perhaps, or certainly a new chancellor, which uh, Germany will have a year from now. Um, going to change um, uh, things much, do you think? Um, uh, so, Claudia, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, and it's great to, to see you all, at least virtually. Um, and it's great to join the debate. Maybe just a very quick point on this AKK Macron um, debate. Uh, we can come back to that in the, in the discussion we will have afterwards. So. It, let me just say that I'm actually deeply irritated because in the content, we know the difference. We have been knowing the difference for years. There's nothing new in it. And what I find highly irritating and maybe we could even say almost irresponsible is to focus so much on the differences rather than spending that energy actually on the implementation for concrete policy proposals. Um, so th there's this famous Freud quote of the narcissism of small differences. And I'm just wondering why we enjoy so much focusing on those differences rather than saying, hey, if we all agree that Europe has to do more on defense, why, just, wh why don't we start? Um, but I'm happy to, to, to come back in the debates and to debate on, on this, uh, the differences between sovereignty and, and autonomy and, and all that kind of things. Um, let, me, uh, let me make three brief points. The first is on, on the role of defense in Germany. I'll put differently, Germany, uh, in Germany, defense remains a, public, a, a problem area or a difficult topic. And I think that the election campaign, which is going to start early next year, will certainly underline this statement again. If we look at it from a more abstract level, we could say that the German debate is caught in trenches. It's EU or NATO. 
it's disarmament or deterrence. It's peace policy or security policy. It's military, yes, or military not. It's defense industry, good or bad. And the problem is if you have such a binary debate, it's very difficult to turn actually to more forward looking um, and a more active security policy. So very quickly, when we talk about certain issues in defense policy, we easily find our way back into the trenches. Um, if we talk about defense or industrial exports, we very easily find ourselves in those camps, which makes debates sometimes almost predictable. So we know what the other side is going to say, um, but it doesn't really help. And if I look ahead to the next government, and I'm very happy to have a black and a green member of parliament in that panel, because they could probably tell me all those things much better than I can do. Um, I just wonder how we are going to address those questions. We have the thematic challenges, how to deal with China, with Russia, how to deal with Afghanistan and Mali. We have the functional challenges for next German defense, secure defense policy, how to deal with cyber, disruptive technology, climate change. And then we have this kind of overarching questions that concern us all, but where it's so utterly difficult to find answers. And one of those is that we are moving currently from a kind of competition of global order system, where we had several order systems in parallel, and now they're increasingly competing. This is what the Americans call the systemic challenge with China. Where are we standing here and how does, this, how does it affect our security policy priorities, um, for example, with crisis prevention. So I wonder what the German answer to that is and how we could overcome the well-known trenches to those questions. The Green Party some days ago published its basic, I don't know whether basic is the right translation on it, so it's kind of fundamental policy program. Um, it's not the election program, don't get me wrong, so there's still another escalation step, um, but it's interesting to say the least. Um, it's full of interesting tensions. There is, on the one hand, um, the importance of NATO underlined, and some pages later, there is a call to leave nuclear sharing arrangements. So it's, it's really interesting to see those tensions being united. My second point, second point I want to make is uh, transatlantic honeymoon and European divorce, or European honeymoon and transatlantic divorce. Slavic and Omid hinted on that already. 2021 is going to be a year, particularly the first six months, which are going to be highly entertaining, to put the least. There are two trends um, which are particularly interesting. And these are the elections in Germany in autumn 2021. So election campaign going to start earlier uh, in 2021. And this corresponds to the honeymoon of the transatlantic relationship, the first months of the Biden administration. Those first months of the transatlantic of the new US president will be extremely charged with expectations from both sides. And we all know that expectations management is always extremely difficult and you usually fail. It's very hard to live up to the expectation one puts up. How will the Europeans live up to the expectations coming from the US? And they will be high and the US will rightly so ask, what are you going to do? You had a previous president Trump, who bullied you, you didn't do much. So we actually expect you to do something on the security and defense relationship in those crucial first months that correspond to the German election campaign. And what I see are inherent tensions that are very difficult to solve. Just give you three examples. Those what might give us in Germany transatlantic credit, higher defense spending, stronger commitment, say in Iraq or in the Sahel or in other areas, might clash with the domestic debate. So transatlantic credits will not be really helpful in the domestic debate. Transatlantic credits, again, on the security and defense, being the transatlantic model pupil, might lead to tensions in Europe. So what might please the Biden administration might not please the French president. There's a big fear in, in France that the European momentum, this idea which has been rather strong over the last years, may just fade. A key or the crucial actor in this European momentum is not only France, it's also Germany as one of the biggest countries. So it's so important to see how Germany is going to position itself on that transatlantic European debate. Defense is not that biggest area of bilateral Franco-German cooperation. It's very problematic, but it's not the crucial one. Um, I think that the recovery fund is a better example of 
excellent and forward-leaning Franco-German relation. But there's, there should be no interest in Germany to weaken the French government some months before the French enter in their election campaign and the presidential election for 2022. So there is a kind of tension between the transatlantic and the domestic level, the transatlantic and the bilateral Franco-German level and the European level. If I look to Poland, there is a strong expectation that Germany gets things right um, and takes the, the interests and expectations from the Central and Eastern European countries into account. Um, so what will Germany's role be? And is it actually possible to live up to all those expectations coming from all sides? So Germany has the, is expected to keep the European house together. Uh, it's expected to get the transatlantic cooperation back on track. It's expected to develop European capacity to act. And it's more or less expected to turn the beginning transatlantic beauty contest where all European countries really would like the place to go to into something meaningful. I mean, hey, this is really meaningful expectations management. This is something where, where it's really, really difficult um, to live up to. My last point is what's actually the real game changer? Um, and I want to make a brief point on the pandemic. I expect the pandemic or at least the secondary consequences to be a defining element in European security and defense in the years to come. The pandemic is not yet over. We don't know how it's going to end and when. What we can already see is that as a health crisis with its secondary economic, political and social consequences, it is likely to have a double effect. It is likely to negatively affect NATO and European capabilities and capacity to act. And it is particularly likely to tremendously negatively affect the global security landscape. And together, this has the potential to be a rather unpleasant and dangerous mix. International conflict might intensify, but the political attention and the instruments from Europeans and the international community to address those conflicts are likely to be increasingly on short supply. So that's a really unpleasant situation. What we already observe or what we could observe over the last months was that structural trends in international relations have intensified. For example, the ongoing US-China rivalry. On the other hand, also over the last months, we could see that the situation, the security situation in third countries has often got worse as a result of the pandemic, but also because international actors modified their commitment Troops have been relieved, um, international missions have stopped, staff has been taken away. We could observe, for example, in countries like Mali, um, that the security incidents have gone up over the last months. So we could probably say that uh, the pandemic served as a, castle, as a catalyst that accelerates existing conflicts and developments, and that might lead to an increased demand on the international community. And at the same time, as initially said, European countries are tempted to focus on the domestic level in view of coping with the economic consequences of the pandemic. And this might include that funding for non-military, but also military instruments um, from civilian crisis prevention up to the armed forces is likely to get down. Not this year. We have all seen the budget provision for this year, which are pretty nice. But if you look in the longer term perspective, um, 2021 up to 2024, this is looking far less nice. Um, and again, the political attention is turning more to managing the crisis at home than to looking abroad. And I assist a little bit on this uh, military aspect because we're talking defense, so I, I think I'm allowed to do that. If you look back to the last financial crisis, which we had in 2007, 2008, um, European countries lost about 35% of their military capabilities over the decades afterwards. And this economic crisis was compared to what we are likely to have in the future, much smaller. So the question is how we are going to cope with that. And that brings me again to the German role. Uh, Germany serves as a cooperation partner to many European countries. Um, many European countries, whether integrated or very closely cooperate with the German armed forces. That also means if Germany is weak, if we don't live up to our, to, our, to our promises, if the Bundeswehr is going to have, is, is, is have, is going to, has to do cuts in the future, this will also affect our European partners. To put it in a very blunt sentences, 
German weakness can very quickly turn into a European weakness. So if I look, um, it's kind of outlook, um, to what is likely to actually define the European capacity to act in defense in the future with uh, regard to the pandemic, it will be the public budgets, again, pretty nice in 21, far less nice after 21, the security environment, which doesn't really look promising, the US contribution and transatlantic relation, which will be in the test phase or expectation management phase in early 21, and the institutional coherence on coordination in European defense between NATO and the EU. We could observe it already today, the report on the future of NATO has been released, um, and we have in parallel the strategic compass running in the EU. So are we going, are we, will we be able to link those various lines of development together, then we could be a bit optimistic. Um, if not, it will be a rather difficult next month. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Claudia. Um, and uh, we will turn to questions from our viewers in just a moment. So let me remind everyone to use the Q&A function, um, which is at the bottom of your Zoom screen. and and submit your question there. Uh, uh, the, the more focused um, and brief the questions are, the easier it is for me to, uh, to use them. So I encourage that. Um, but before we turn to the questions, I wanted to uh, pick up on something that was uh, a thread in both what uh, David Bertolotti and Claudia Mayor said, and that is the regional security issues. In other words, outside of Europe, but in Europe's vicinity. Um, uh, Claudia mentioned it in the context of the pandemic and the possibility of additional conflict, but uh, David mentioned it more, more broadly. Uh, and he asked a question, which I want to pose to our two members of the Bundestag. Um, you know, I was struck that uh, you know, we've been talking not just about uh, security inside Europe, but the external um, uh, environment. And the mandate question that uh, David Bertolotti asked, um, do you see a changing um, dynamic in Germany for the conditions under which uh, German forces might participate in, um, in coalition or multinational uh, uh, operations. Uh, I'll let uh, either Volker Ulrich or Omid Nouripour begin, whichever one of you would like to uh, uh, respond first. Please, Omid. Um. If I may, would love to to make two different points very briefly to that what I heard. Yeah, and then and then come to the to your question. Um, I, I first I fully agree with that what David said that the question of AKK versus um, versus President Macron has been some kind of a theological uh, discussion. I to be honest, I never again want to. Uh, I want to be prevented from going to bed till six o'clock in the morning waiting for the results of Sedona, uh, Arizona, because it's relevant for our sovereignty, okay? So the question of European sovereignty is key for that moment, but that does not mean that we, that we shouldn't cooperate with the United States, and that does not mean that in the moment when both sides are reliable, we shouldn't come back to the best we have in this scenario, the, the shared values we have as, as alliances of, I don't know, Call it whatever you want, but as, as, as a team up, this is better than, than the alliance of democracies, team up of democracy. Um, second, I just want to um, put it in a more accurate way what I said about the chi our China approach, and once again, referring to that, what David said. It's definitely, when I said we should be America's sidekick when it comes to China, it does not mean that we, have, we do not have our own, our own interest here and they could cross the American interest or the way America is trying to deal with China. Also, decoupling is no option for us. Uh, just one example. So of course, it's about our interest, but I think it's our interest to team up where we can with the, with the United States to contain China. Uh, the question of the mandate, there are, I, I'm not sure if I, if I understand the question because there are different types of, of or the different level of, of, of mandate. One is, uh, German tradition of, of asking the parliament before you deploy uh, armed forces. At first, it never had been a spoiler for, for any German engagement. 
it always had been our governments going to Brussels, and they they're not saying no if they want to say no, just 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 hiding um, hiding behind behind a parliament. But there never came a mandate of a German government to the Bundestag. Definitely not a one which has been coordinated with our partners in the NATO and in the EU. And we just said no, never happened and never gonna happen. I'm not quite sure uh, that it, uh, this, this, this won't happen. So, and, and by the way, if I remember that right, some of this kind of discussions about uh, military engagements we had in other countries showed, at least to me, that that's always not that wrong in a moment when uh, public participation to, to such kind of discussion is, 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 is reached because of social media, because of our connectivity uh, at another level. We need public debate for, for military engagement, and there's no better place for that than, than the parliament. And uh, so I don't think it's, it's wrong to have a con parliamentary consultation for our uh, military engagement. Um, if you're talking about a, the UN mandate, uh, you know, this is not about UN mandate, it's about international law. And if we're talking about sharing values and about rule of law, we have to defend. We should stick to the international law also. I know the blockade of the United Nations Security Council. Uh, I know that uh, there are a lot of discussions, for example, for coming back to United for Peace from in, in the 15th and so on. But at the end of the day, uh, we see that the blockade, for example, of, of Russia is because of a power projection we missed to, 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 um, to stand against. Uh, I, I think power projection, and, and this is fully other diff, and a fully different discussion than, than the question of the mandate. But I think power projection is, is well done by, 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 by the Chinese. There is no accident that, that in the middle of the pandemic they touch the moon today, I think, um, to, to show us that we are dealing with the pandemic and they're, they're flying to the moon. Uh, and this is part projection par excellence, and I think we have to, to learn a lot from that, what they're doing. And by the way, what, it, what, what the Russians are doing there. But coming back to the mandate, um, I think it's uh, the international law is giving us a lot of measures we could take. We, we didn't use properly yet, and we have to talk, talk about it. Also, but uh, the Supreme Court, it's the Constitutional Court of Germany, judgment to say that Germany never should walk alone, but also always be within the within, of, within systems of collective defense, means that there's no, it's not that complicated to find ways to, to frame different engagements uh, by, by the EU. We have just to try. So the answer to your question, sir, is I do not need a necessity for, for going without any mandate. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Omid. Uh, Volker Ulrich, did, did, would you like to uh, weigh in on that? Uh, thank you very much. Following the remarks of uh, Omid Nuripur, I want to point out that we have to distinguish between the constitutional framework and uh, the system of collective uh, security. First, when it comes to um, putting uh, the Bundeswehr, our armed forces abroad, um, it is always the German Bundestag uh, which has to be consent uh, with the mission. Um, it is due to our concept of, uh, uh, of armed forces of the parliament. So the armed forces are under no circumstances under the only disposal of the government. It is only, it is always the parliament which has to decide upon um, uh, whatever mission is carried out. So uh, when it comes to four or three soldiers uh, uh, in, in Darfur, it is the German Bundestag uh, will have to decide. So uh, the German armed forces uh, are, uh, not as flexible as uh, the armed forces of other NATO states or uh, EU member states uh, due to our constitutional restriction when it comes to the decision of the German Bundestag. And uh, 
the reason whether we whether the German Bundestag has to agree on uh, a mission or not uh, is deeply rooted uh, in our constitution. There is Article uh, 24, uh, which says that um, uh, armed forces abroad are only possible within a framework of uh, collective security. And the question is, what means collective security? There has been uh, a parliamentary debate between uh, uh, my party and the Green Party uh, whether uh, the anti daesh mandate of the Bundeswehr uh, is under uh, the rule of uh, collective uh, security. And uh, the Green Party declined, whereas uh, our party uh, agreed. And um, uh, it, it is not uh, it is not crystal clear what means uh, collective uh, uh, security framework. Um, I think we have to um, let happen uh, a discussion within German uh, politics. Uh, what means a system of uh, collective uh, framework? I think we should broaden. Uh, the dimension of a collective framework, but we aren't able to leave uh, any framework of uh, NATO, of United Nations, or uh, a mission deeply rooted uh, in the figure of, uh, um, uh, of international human rights protection. So it uh, still will uh, regard uh, with regard to other uh, nation state of NATO and EU, will be a kind of the, the constitutional burdens will be a kind of limit uh, to our uh, uh, possibilities. Uh, but um, I think we, to, to some extent, uh, uh, we have to to, to live with uh, these restrictions. I do not see um, a relief of. Um, uh, parliament, uh, parliamentary consent and do not see any relief of a uh, system of international security. Thank you, Volker Ulrich. Uh, Claudia Mayor, did you want to uh, uh, say a word about, uh, about this? No? Um, okay. Um, I would like to pick up on some questions we have gotten um, that relate to the, uh, the aspect of China that, uh, that has been mentioned by several um, speakers. And if I can try to pull them together, um, there is, uh, I think, a growing recognition uh, in, uh, certainly uh, in Germany, that, uh, that China is a uh, more complicated factor in international affairs than was assumed just a few years ago. There's been a parallel process in the United States, which is much more advanced and which has uh, deep bipartisan support. Um, and there's a similar trend in Europe. Uh, but I, I'd like to ask, um, uh, for thoughts from those who would like to chime in um, about whether this, um, you know, the, the European role um, in uh, in addressing China's the China challenge um, has a security dimension, um, uh, or for Europe, uh, or is it principally an economic, technological, um, and diplomatic um, uh, challenge? In other words, should Europe be engaged uh, in addressing the security aspects um, of the China challenge? Uh, I see Slavic sitting up in his chair. Does that uh, mean you're ready to, to chime in? Yes, yes. I'll, I'll, if, if you, I would like to share a few thoughts about, uh, about that. First, um, there, is a, there is a political challenge um, that Europe should um, um, face and shape its, its, its policy um, accordingly, and you know the recent uh, example of um, China's bullying Australia is quite a good illustration uh, because uh, 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 this example uh, tells us all Europeans a question whether we should show solidarity somehow we should react on that whether we should uh, align with with uh, um, a democratic country, a uh, member of the free world, um, and um, uh, come with a kind of the political assistance um, uh, 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 to 
the, you know, in, in this situation to help Australians to face uh, uh, China's aggressive uh, uh, policy? My answer is yes, because there's the only way we could uh, consolidate um, the free world um, uh, and it's the only way which we can uh, together shape effective response to this kind of China's uh, policy. If we don't react now, sooner or later, we in Europe will face exactly the same, um, uh, you know, uh, we'll feel exactly the same uh, Chinese tools on, on our own skin. So, that's one example. Another example is um, South China Sea. Uh, there is an um, interlink in between uh, the case of Crimea, uh, territorial and grabbed by Russia, and what China is doing there. So if we want to, um, to defend the norms and standards of international law, if we want to, um, uh, to protect um, um, this system uh, that has been created uh, over the last uh, decades. Uh, we cannot turn back uh, from a uh, South China Sea issue. We should try to uh, shape our, our common stance with uh, the Pacific nations. And, and here I agree with, with uh, David's calls for you know, more um, discussion within the Europe, how our European Union should shape its own stance uh, in, uh, toward the Pacific. It's, it, it's not a theoretical academical issue. It's purely political thing. So without this, and, and you know, uh, uh, I think Germany should be prized uh, by their new uh, adopted strategy towards uh, um, uh, um, the Pacific uh, uh, region. Because you know they they show the lead how um, this discussion and how our thinking should be framed, and uh, coming back to the military issue, it's not only economic thing our relations with with China. Uh, we have to bear in mind that we are dealing with uh, you know a technological uh, the coming technological revolution. So if we are unable to set a, a proper uh, safe for our citizens, uh, for our democratic uh, uh, society's standards. Um, uh, if we allow, for instance, China to, to uh, set their own uh, based on unfreedom uh, uh, technological uh, uh, standards, then all our citizens uh, would be threatened sooner or later. So that's, it's not only economic issue, it's purely uh, also a, a security issue uh, coming from uh, new technologies which, which are spreading uh, across the world. Thank you, Slavic. Uh, any other panelists want to uh, uh, comment on that? Uh, I, I, I see uh, David and uh, Claudia and Omid. Uh, uh, David, since you were addressed uh, directly by Slavic, I'll let you go first, then we'll come to Claudia and Omid. Um, thank you, Jeff. Um, I mean, three three quick points because I I think that in in, in response to your question, I mean, and then the questions of our of our uh, of the participants, um, that there are three three circles in in my view in which you you can consider the the issue. Um, I mean, first of all, is is the regional security issue in in Asia, uh, and. Uh, and, and, and the question of whether or not, in fact, we should uh, counterbalance the push uh, of, of China asserting itself in, in its immediate uh, neighborhood, uh, which again, from, from a sort of geopolitical standpoint, you, you can understand. I mean, you, you can conceivably understand why, why China now uh, will, will want to do that. Uh, and, and there, I mean, if I take a, a realistic and a realist in terms of international theory point of view, uh, I would say that there are a lot of neighbors um, in the area um, that have together the ability to balance uh, that push uh, and, and, and the US or the EU for that matter uh, could, relatively speaking, uh, take a, a back seat, but, uh, I mean, support them, but take, take a back seat. With, of course, one caveat, 
which is that um, some of us, and that's typically the case in France, uh, have uh, interests uh, or a presence uh, in, in the area. I mean, typically France is, is also a, a nation of the Pacific, um, so we, we are not just uh, by, by standards, uh, uh, bystanders, sorry. Um, the, the second circle is, is I think, I, would, I mean, the threats uh, to, to our direct uh, European interests. And, and there, I think uh, we should look uh, as a matter of priority. And I think that's what we've started to do as things like uh, cyber, uh, tech in, in, in general, um, perhaps space security uh, with uh, the new Chinese uh, capabilities. Uh, also, of course, uh, uh, the, the nuclear uh, profile of, of China, and by maybe not uh, being as alarmist as, as the current US administration is, but, but the nuclear buildup is, is something that Europeans should uh, pay uh, more attention to. But in this box, I would also point to uh, areas of convergence or potential convergence to solve other crises, uh, um, uh, North Korea, uh, Iran, uh, for instance. Uh, and then there's a third circle, which is perhaps sort of spontaneously marginally about security, but which affects the influence of, uh, of, of the EU, and that's the whole debate about values, uh, whether or not we should stand up uh, for our European uh, values or see as universal uh, precisely and not just European uh, uh, because if we uh, let them uh, under attack and, and be undermined it is our global influence that is undermined including in, in areas uh, uh, close to us uh, and, and, and that could in turn harm our security. So I see those three circles really the, the regional security, uh, the sort of um, you know broader Potential threats in in the in the tech area, and and then the value. Okay, thank you, uh, Claudia. Thank you. Um, just maybe two two quick comments. I think it's really important to underline again that that uh, China is considered a systemic challenge, and that means it's offering a different system, be it political, economic, or others. Um, not just in one dimension, but in the overall system it proposes, to which most European, or a version that most European and Americans uh, would oppose to. And I think this makes it such a, such a great challenge for, for European and transatlantic partners. I think it's particularly challenging for Germany to deal with it, because it proves actually wrong that the theory that was for a long time dominant in German foreign policy didn't work, and that's the idea of convergence. If we would only work close enough together, um, and if we, if we would show the positive aspects of our political and economic systems, countries would follow that path. It didn't work with Russia, and it didn't work with China. Um, but the idea that we had after the end of the Cold War, that this kind of conviction that the, the liberal order in which we live is somehow the best model we have, and why don't the others understand it, um, it's quite a difficult lesson to learn. I think this partly explains why Germany, it took Germany pretty long um, to actually take a, a tougher stance um, on China. I think we have seen, and um, here I would agree with uh, David, we have several dimensions on how we are concerned by, by China. And I would focus on one which, which hasn't, been, hasn't been elaborated a lot um, until now, and that's not only that we have to face China in a security dimension in the region, Asia, but actually the security and defense challenge China is posing in Europe or for European defense. Um, and that might sound very, very simple. But if you look at who is owning critical infrastructure, I'm not only talking about Greek ports, but also talking about Baltic installations, Baltic ports. So how this is going to, what is going to happen in a critical situation with those critical infrastructure owned by China. Um, there have been Chinese ships in the Baltics for exercises and in the Mediterranean. Um, and I think it would be interesting to know how many French ships and how many Chinese ships we have in the Mediterranean. I think it would be a rather unpleasant figure. We have the economic ties of many uh, European countries with China with the Belt and Road Initiative. And we have the investment um, in, many, in many economic uh, and technological areas. 
So the question is, to what extent this affects our capacity as European and NATO countries to defend ourselves in a critical conflict? And this is why I think we need not only to focus on, on China being a challenge in Asia, but it's actually right here in Europe. Um, and this is also a very visible moment that talking defense, countries attempted to think about NATO. This is not something NATO can take care of it on its own. But this is where this famous EU-NATO link um, comes in because many areas from classical traditional defense up to screening investments uh, come together. Screening investments, something the commission is doing better than NATO and uh, ships probably NATO is doing better than the European Commission. Um, so I think this is one challenge. And maybe just one, one last point. Um, I think the key question in the end, if you talk about how we are getting on uh, Americans and Europeans, uh, I think we could probably put it into a, into a rather simplistic question. And this is who of the two presidents we have, Biden or Trump, is the exception in US political developments? Was Trump the exception? This is what we all hope for. Or maybe is Biden the exception? And afterwards, we turn back to a Trump-style American politician, and we will start all those debates about European and transatlantic relations again. And only this perspective of Biden being the exception should really make us think twice about our commitments in all areas, but given that we talk here about security, particularly in secure defense. Thanks, Claudia. Omid. There's not a lot I can add, but uh, we finally have a golden uh, window of opportunity to do all of that, what our experts just, just said, uh, by having a EU cohesion on China we maybe never had before. The mood is changing, especially in, in Central Europe, and this is good. There are things that Germany could also do much more to um, to once again, to, to bring the European Union together in this. Um, the 5G debate we have in Germany is not the uniter of Europe, for example, but we see that, you know, look at the, the president of the, of the Senate of Czech Republic and his trip to, to Taiwan recently. This is amazing. And, you know, two years ago, you, I couldn't imagine that because uh, Czech Republic was not in that mood. So the pandemics, I, this disadvantage that the European, not all of them, but 26 of the European, uh, of the EU members are now waking up, and then we can we have use, we have to, to to use this opportunity. Thanks, um, uh, Volker Ulrich. Did you want to uh, say another word about uh, China? Thank you. As I mentioned in my uh, initial remarks. I think the China issue is not only referred to a, secure, to a security dimension. It's only a competition. It's, uh, it's rather a competition between uh, two systems. And uh, what system works better uh, to grant uh, welfare and prosperity and well-being to people? Is it uh, a Western model built on the rule of law and democracy and uh, dignity and freedom? Or is it uh, a model based on uh, state capitalism, uh, surveillance, and, uh, and rather or uh, strict, I would say, authoritarian approach when it comes to govern uh, a country? And um, uh, when it uh, comes uh, to the dimension of welfare, uh, China ha has proved that state capitalism under the rule of uh, a communist party is able to leave uh, to, uh, to boost uh, welfare for uh, hundreds of millions of people. And when it comes to uh, fighting the pandemic uh, or uh, building infrastructure, um, there are some some glimpses uh, on China whether uh, an authoritarian state is uh, to some extent uh, doing um, uh, do, doing doing faster and, and more efficient, but efficiency in some 
political affairs is not the only uh, kind to uh, to judge a, a political system. It, it should be um, rather the question of uh, freedom and the rule of law and uh, the right to to participate. And um, I think uh, the struggle between two systems uh, uh, is uh, is not yet decided because there are other of uh, authoritarian seductions in other parts of the world, and uh, we have uh, to stick to uh, the democracy, uh, to democracy, and the Western um, uh, comprehension of, of rule of law, and. Uh, we have to promote that, and uh, uh, that's, in my, in my view, uh, the overlaying uh, question uh, on, 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 on the China debate. Well, I want to thank um, all of our panelists for uh, you know, really uh, thoughtful uh, and, and challenging uh, I, presentations that will set the stage for the coming days of the uh, International Security Forum. Um, we've uh, we've talked uh, today about uh, about European security, about regional security, about the transatlantic relationship, uh, about uh, dealing with uh, what many people in in the United States consider to be the biggest uh, challenge uh, ahead: uh, how to construct our relations with China in a way um, that is uh, principled uh, and effective, and how to do that with our transatlantic partners. Um, and uh, and so uh, let me let me thank uh, Slavik Devsky, uh, Omid Nuripur. Claudia Mayor, Volker Ulrich, uh, and David Bertolotti, uh, and especially Ulrich Schlie and the University of Bonn and Cassis. I also want to thank the United States Embassy in Berlin for their support, which made this webinar possible. Uh, and uh, I look forward to, to being part of the uh, upcoming discussions in the International Security Forum and wish everyone all the best. Um, and uh, have a good evening, those of you in Europe, and a good day um, for our, our friends and uh, and uh, viewers in the United States.